Well, good morning and welcome to Calvary. What a wonderful call to worship. Thanks so much, guys. Appreciate that. Today is Impact Sunday number two, and we are so excited this morning that you've joined us. Impact is the word that Calvary uses to describe both missions far away and outreach close by. And we've got a lot of exciting things going on here at Calvary. Thank you for coming to worship today. Thank you for those of us who have joined us from home. We're so glad that you are here. We have vision lunches coming up. I know you've heard about vision lunches already. We're offering them once a month to give you an opportunity to come and hear about Calvary's new vision. And it's a very casual setting. It's an opportunity to ask questions. And we've got another one coming up next Sunday, November 20th at 1145 AM. And we need to know who's coming because we want to have food for you. So we encourage you to go online and sign up if you are interested and if you haven't been to one yet. We've got one more coming up on December 11th. So pick the best date, RSVP, and we really hope to see you there. <clears throat> this is also the week where we remember Veterans Day. And this morning we want to wish a happy Veterans Day belated to all those who have served and who have stood in the gap for our freedom, and to the families who have sacrificed so that we could do so. And we, we commend you and we thank you. We are grateful to you. Let's give our vets a hand. <clears throat> Well, you can see the choir has joined me. I think they've got something in mind. We've got another call to worship. We just heard the instruments play an invitation to come and join, and now we'll hear the choir do so as well. Join to sing, alleluia, amen, loud praise to Christ our King, alleluia, amen. Let all with heart and voice before his throne rejoice, praise is his gracious choice, alleluia, amen.
be seated. We are blessed at Calvary to have a number of students who attend Luther Seminary who come and worship with us each week from countries all over the globe. Come on up, Anoop. And one of them has become a dear friend to the choir as he's sung with us so many, many times. Anoop is from India, and we're having him, we're inviting him to pray this morning in two languages, I believe. Please pray with us. Good morning, church. Uh, first, I'll pray in my mother tongue, which is Telugu, and I'll continue. In English, let us bow our heads and pray. Prema Namakamukalina twenty, the Aluduana Thandri, Nina Nedu, Ekaritiga Unavada. E Parishuta Dinana, Ni Samukumlo Cheradaniki, Ni Nustutin Chidaniki, Ni Vakim Vinadaniki, Ni Makichin at twenty Avakashim Bati, Ni Nustutis Tunam. Endro Gatin Chipoyaru, Kani, Ni Mamul and Inukoni, Ni Sanitanamonic Church Nanduku, Ni Kuananamalu. Mamulan Ashru is two, Majivitalo, Mirunar and in Rintramu Ruju Chestu Nanduku, Niku Stuti. Isamamlo, Memu Cheyu Pradan and Alakinchi, Vatiki Javabla and Udai Chemani, Vedukuntu Namu. Dear living and loving Lord, who dwells in the highest and who is amongst us today in this holy sanctuary, we come to your throne of grace with one accord to pray and lift the missionaries worldwide and their families for their commitment and unwavering courage for gospel's sake. Lord, you said, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Yes, Lord, we give praise to you for those who took this holy responsibility. We admit your presence is always with them, strengthening them in the persecution, walking alongside them in their every step. Thank you for taking care of them and meeting their needs. Help us to be your instruments to continue to support them in prayer and deed. We especially pray for the countries where persecution is prevailing, where preaching the good news is a criminal offense and life-threatening. Your children and our brothers and sisters in Christ are there living their testimony, testimonies. They are helping people and serving the destitute. Change the hearts of the leaders and the people in those countries. O oh Lord, let your love and compassion flow through your children. We pray for the believers who live in fear in those countries. Give them hope of salvation, courage to love, and grace to forgive. We know at times it is hard, but remind us again and again that you will never leave them nor forsake them. Thank you for the blessing you gave to our church to take part in their journey and be the answer to their prayers. Thank you for making us known that your word is justice, your word is truth, and your word is transformational. Shower your blessings on those who preach and support upholding this message of justice, truth, and love. Help us see and experience these miracles in this world and listen to the life-changing stories we are part of. Thank you for loving us and caring for us until we meet you in heaven. Give us the strength to follow you faithfully. With a humble heart, we submit this prayer at your feet. We love you, Lord. Amen. sing a response to what we've heard. I love you, Lord. Take joy 
We're the Oaks family, and we had the opportunity to go to Poznan, Poland for a missions trip as a family this year. We really wanted to show our kids how we can serve together as a family and to just show them that God is all over the world, you know, and that the big church is, is all over. So often when you go as a family, you think, okay, like maybe I could do so much more with just me as an individual, you know, and you don't have the different constraints that a family may bring, but just seeing the impact that being there as a family had, kind of as a, like the body of Christ, just each being able to touch different people and connect with different people was just so rich. Well, we were very encouraged by just spending the time with the, with the families that were there, the team, the Converge team. I think one of the main things that I walked away from was their passion and their love for the Polish people. Steve Valentine has just a great heart for his team and a heart for raising up new leaders. And, you know, we asked Steve, what are the top priorities for you? And it was, it was about developing hearts for God and a passion for the people and and just doing great kingdom work. And he's just, he's very sensitive to um, helping people make the right choices to invest long-term in kingdom work. Mm -hmm. Really would love to have people come and be part of a prayer effort. There's also the chance for summer internships in Poznan. And Andrew, um, mm -hmm. Andrew's a young guy who's, who's just learning the language, but he, he would love to bring other people in and, and then there's this kind of this new effort up in Szczecin. They've got a ministry center and there could be some really cool ways to plug in. And it's a great place to see God working and, and he would love to partner with and find ways to, to have a, a team come. When you go on a missions trip, you have the opportunity to step into this place that's maybe a little bit uncomfortable, that causes you to depend on God in a greater way. It causes you to really ask what he's teaching you. It gives you this tangible opportunity to depend on him. And for us, it just ignites us when we come home and the mission God's called us to here. But like every mission trip, you end up walking away with most of the, the blessing, I feel no. like. Mission trips in general are, there's so much about what you can learn and how you can grow in your faith and be inspired. And I think that's equally, I mean, you go to encourage, but you walk away with such a blessing from being with the people because they're in, inspiring in the way that they live. Just seeing God at work uh, throughout the world. I think also it's an encouragement. It's really hard over there. I mean, it's, it's less than 1% are Bible-believing Christians. It's a tough work. Um, it, it'll kind of open your heart, but it'll also be a way just to make a connection and see how God is working in a, in a really difficult setting. Hey, if our brothers and sisters in Christ in Poland are being lights in the world with a less than 1% population of Bible-believing Christians, then we can be a light in our schools, in our neighborhoods, in our spaces, and we're all on the same mission together. So that's why I would encourage people to go. What an exciting ministry impact partner with Steve and Jenny Valentine in Poland. It's always fun to kind of hear a little bit about people who have a passion to reach other people for Jesus Christ. And I'm excited to be here today. Welcome to those of you who are at White Bear and watching us online as well. My name is John Wicklin. I'm the executive director of an incredible ministry called Trout Lake Camps. So I've been there 18 years. And prior to that, I was actually on staff at Calvary Church a long time ago. And so it's great to be back here with you today. One of the things that you should know is that Calvary Church has been an unbelievable ministry partner with us, Trout Lake. For the last 20 years, Calvary has been the number one church, in my opinion, about helping us transform the ministry. And I'm just here simply to say thank you. Thank you for all of your hard work over the years. I'm looking forward to the next several uh, weeks and months ahead. I know the, the flurries are starting to come down. And for me personally, I just like to get outside. I'm an outside guy. So if you don't know anything about me, um, my Enneagram, I'm a seven. 
strength finders, I'm an achiever. I take Advil like it's candy because I like to push myself a little bit. I know my golf handicap is going down. That's a good thing, by the way. Golf handicap's going down. I know I'm starting to get a little bit better with my relationships with my teenager. I mean, I am just wired to try to get a little bit stronger and faster and more flexible and maybe wiser. And that's who I am. But what about you? What do you like to get better at? What are you trying to improve? For some of us in this room, we might want to be better grandparents. We might want to get better at our marriage, maybe money management, video games for the young kids. Maybe it's academics. I don't know what it is for you. You know, we could go on and on with the list, but as the weather has been changing, I want to improve on my downhill skiing. I grew up skiing as a kid up until the age of 18 years old, and then for decades, I stopped skiing. Fast forward 25 years later, the sport has totally changed. The ski shapes are different. People wear helmets now. I mean, supposedly, it was just like riding a bike to strap on the skis and go. Now, I had the opportunity to ski with one of my friends out west. His name's Matt. And we were in ideal snow conditions. For two days straight, it had snowed 21 inches of fresh snow. So I decide, <laughs> let's go rent a pair of high-end skis, right? There's great conditions. So you rent what are called powder skis. They're big, fat skis. It's kind of like you're skiing on a four by eight sheet of plywood on the snow. And the next morning, with all this new snow, the ski resort just comes alive. There's a buzz in the air. If you've ever been at a Disney park at 8 a.m. when they're ready to open the park, I mean, everybody's amped up. Or if you're a marathon runner and you're at the start of the race and you can feel the music pumping at the U.S. Bank Stadium, or maybe you're a movie-going person and you were there when the Star Wars series just came out at midnight, Mall of America. I was there. <laughs> but you can picture hundreds of people waiting to go up the gondola. My friend and I were the second gondola to go up the mountain. We get up to the top, we throw our skis on, and if you don't know anything about skiing, what you want to do is you want to get into an athletic position and you put your weight over your toes and your heels and you get all your joints and ligaments lined up and you get ready to go, shoulder width apart. We start going down the hill and the very first thing that happens, I make my first turn and bam, I fall forward like a rag doll, skis come off, poles go everywhere. Fortunately, I'm okay and I'm thinking, I just have to find my skis. 21 inches of snow. Now, I'm a researcher as well. So the night before, I had gone on YouTube and had Googled how do you find stuff in powder, and they tell you to treat it like a CSI crime scene. <laughs> You're supposed to look back up at the mountain. You see the path that you were skiing. I found one of my arms went in over here. My other arm went over here. My head was way back over there. And we had to recreate this mess that happened on the hill. I found my first ski, which was great. The second ski I thought was close by, so I started to take my ski, and I started to kind of shovel. And I kept shoveling. And it was like the Good Samaritan story. You know, it's like all of a sudden the, the priest skier goes by, and then the Levite skier goes by. They were hooting and hollering. You know, people would actually slow down and say, oh, did you lose your ski? That's such a bummer. And they'd keep going. <laughs> we kept searching. Now, keep in mind, we're in the middle of about a thousand acre bowl out west looking for a ski. And I'm sitting there scooping and scooping, praying that Jesus would help us find this ski. 
Got to keep the theology correct. And we searched an area probably about 1,600 square feet on my knees shoveling, and I was absolutely discouraged and drenched. And along comes Ski Patrol. Dun, dun, dun. Ski Patrol comes by. She does this methodical little sweeping technique down the hill. In 75 feet from where I had fallen, she puts her hand in the snow and says, hey, is this your ski? And I went nuts. I mean, I, I said, hey, what's your name? And her name was Amy Reynolds is what she told us. And then I went into my high school mode. I say, Amy, you say Reynolds. Amy, Amy. Yes, I can feel the excitement. <laughs> Have you ever had a moment in your life where you were ecstatic to find something? Just off the charts excited? Maybe it was your keys, your iPhone, your wallet, diamond earrings. Did you know there's an incredible section in scripture that talks about celebrating when we find something lost? If you've got your Bibles, I encourage you to open them up or your Bible app. Luke 15, we're starting at verse 1. You can also follow along on the screen. Luke 15, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Story goes on, verse 8. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and she loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin in the same way I tell you the truth. There will be rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus tells us that we should rejoice when someone gives control of their life over to him. That's exciting. We should celebrate that. It is way bigger than finding a lost ski. Think about this. How much is seeing somebody come to Jesus a big deal for you? The question I want to wrestle with today is, where is your heart in reaching people for Jesus? Is this something that gets you excited? Are you involved in that? I mean, are you all in? My daughter, the last orthodontist appointment that she had, when the brace comes off, in the office, they start cranking Celebration by Cool and the Gang. <laughs> Celebrate good times. Come on. Come on. Yeah, you know the song. <laughs> or for some of us in this room, we're simply along for the ride. Just coasting along. You've strapped on the skis. You're coasting downhill. There's no turns. There's no effort. You're taking the easiest run down. I mean, downhill is your favorite gear in life. I mentioned earlier that I love to try to get better at things. 
And one thing I'm working on as well is mountain biking. There's something special about when you're with your friends and your kids and you get on your bike and you start biking hard and after about 30 minutes, I look like this. <laughs> and that's true. <laughs> that's it. Okay. About eight weeks ago, I was just finishing, coming up to the end of a trail. I was probably going two to three miles an hour. And I had the most epic crash that I've ever had in my life. My friend said it was probably the most athletic thing that I've done or the most unathletic thing that I've ever done. If you zoom into the shirt there, you can see exactly what happened. There's a mark right there. There's a tread mark. I actually ran over myself on my own bike. <laughs> This actually can happen. I had no idea it could. I'm biking along. I go over my handlebars. I ride my front tire. That's my front tire. I tuck my neck in so that I don't break my neck, and I completely do a flip and land on my rear. You can also see the, how that happened with that massive rock on the screen, two inches high. But every day we run into people who have crashed. Every day we run into people who run themselves over either emotionally, relationally, or spiritually. They make a train wreck of their life. Probably right now some of us can think about a loved one or someone who we really care about that doesn't yet know Jesus. And it hits us because we know that a belief in Christ and believing in his scripture will bring about amazing forgiveness and healing and hope and joy. You see, it's those little bumps in life that can get us off course. We can flip and get in the wrong lane and we lose track about what's most important, which is reaching other people for Jesus. And at Calvary Church, and I'm speaking to myself as well, there's this huge risk that we have where our intellectual assent in theology, meaning we know in our minds that this is a great thing and we should know this, and we, and we should actually do this, and we, we know that in our mind, but there's a difference in our emotions and our behaviors. Some of us might be thinking, well, this telling other people about Jesus, it's just not who I am. And I would ask, what's holding you back? Is there something in your life that has to be changed so that this becomes a greater priority in our life? Maybe you're lacking something. Maybe even some of you are saying, John, this, this just still, it's not me. I want to be clear. I'm asking the question, where is your heart in reaching people for Jesus? Not to shame or guilt anyone. It's an encouragement to pick yourself up, dust off your shoes and pants, and get back on the bike of reaching other people for Jesus. I want to encourage you to be an active participant. Paul, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, has a great verse. This is becoming one of my new favorite verses, and it's a great prayer that talks about strengthening us with power. Ephesians 3, starting at verse 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in on heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that 
you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Jesus will strengthen us with power in our inner being. That means that we will have the full measure of the fullness of God. The full measure of the fullness of God. Jesus will give us the strength to share his love. You might feel inadequate at times to do this. You might be thinking, well, this, this is really hard. Or some of us might actually say, man, I'm, I'm supposed to seal the deal when, when, and, and help people convert to Christ, and it's on my shoulders. That's my responsibility. The main theological point here is it is with Christ and his power that works through us, and all we ought to have to do is have soft edges and display the love of Christ in a gentle way to other people. 2 Timothy verse, chapter 1, verse 7 is another great verse that talks about this. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but it gives us power and love and discipline. Calvary Church, as I look around this room, and I know folks over at White Bear and, and probably some folks watching online, there are tremendous people in this church. God has given you unbelievable off-the-chart talent and resources, and I know this because you have been actively involved in partnering with Trout Lake Camps. On one weekend, 153 of you came up to Trout Lake and served to get the camp ready for summertime ministry. Carlson's, you were there. Schmitz, you were there. Nelson's were there. Miller's were there. Teresa, one of our kids' ministry directors at White Bear, came up to Trout this past summer to be a camp speaker and communicated the gospel to hundreds of kids. See, the beautiful thing is there's this movement from this intellectual understanding of evangelism to participation. And we never know what our small, simple actions will have on shaping somebody's calling in their life. Take a look. Twelve-year-old, I didn't fit. I was loud. I was assertive. I was aggressive. Basically, I was too much. I heard that for pretty much my whole life. I was confident. I feel like in who God created me to be. Because at home, I was loved and I was supported. But outside of the home, it was really tough. And I tried to fit in, and it just never. sixth grade, I went to Trout Lake Camp, and something happened in my heart. I met a cabin leader who I will never forget. Her name is Carla, and for the first time in my life, there was someone who saw me and who celebrated me. We 
we had water relays, as one should, at uh, camp. And Carla came to me outside of our cabin, and she said, I need my strongest girl to carry the greased watermelon, and you're my strongest girl. And I know that sounds weird and a little creepy and maybe simple at the time, but to have someone say that to me, and she wanted to lift that up and celebrate that in me, and then even better, we're down there in the water relay. Carla was on the dock, running on the dock alongside of me, yelling my name and cheering for me as I held the stupid greased watermelon. And I can put myself there in a heartbeat. And to think that she was in college, that she was so young, that she hadn't lived a crazy amount of life yet, and she knew enough to do that for me and to see me and to celebrate me, it literally changed my life. <laughs> Whenever I think of Trout, I will think of her and what she did for me. So looking back, clearly, she was being the hands and feet of Jesus. She was loving the one that was maybe a little bit on the outside, seeing the potential like Jesus saw in his disciples. You know, that's what she was doing. But what I knew as a 12-year-old girl is that felt right. And because I was in the space of Trout where Jesus was held high, and that's what we were learning and teaching about, it just all made sense in that way. favorite part about every week at Trout Lake Camp was that it came to an end. That particular ending of the week after sixth grade was the hardest. I remember standing in the courtyard right out by the bell and Carla was there and she was saying goodbye to all the campers and it came my turn to say goodbye to her. The bus was about to leave and she was standing there in her denim jacket <laughs> and she was hugging me and I did not want to let go because I felt like I didn't want this to end. I got on the bus and I was just bawling like a baby and it continued for a long time. And somewhere in the middle of the trip, I was looking out the window of the bus and I remember thinking to myself, I want to do this for someone someday to make someone feel seen and celebrated. And looking back now, I literally believe that in that moment, God was fashioning me for what he has called me to do, not just now, not just for the last 25 years, but for the rest of my adult mm. life. And I'm so grateful. Calvary, when it's all said and done, and the game gets put back in the box. May we live like Carla did. Jesus used Carla to impact Heather, and now Heather is impacting thousands of middle school kids every year. See, evangelism doesn't have to be that hard. I want to encourage us to take this spirit of celebration into our daily life so that we can communicate the gospel to everyone around us. It doesn't have to be going door to door, knocking on people's you know, homes that we don't even know. 
You don't have to do it Trout Lake style where we would be running up and down the aisles right now giving each other high fives. Maybe you have a little quieter presence and your personality is a little softer. Maybe it's a kind word or a gentle action to somebody who's in need. Maybe even when we're standing in line at restaurants and we know the person across the counter is overworked and they're understaffed and we're waiting for our food, we can still show the gospel in very practical ways. So may we be a church that pours ourselves into people around us so that the message of Christ has a ripple impact in our community. And as we prepare for the week ahead, as we get ready to leave this place, I've got five really quick ideas for you to maybe consider to live this out. Number one, be in the right mindset. Nobody wants to hear the gospel from somebody who's crabby and cranky. Practice living out the fruit of the Spirit and pray for that as well. Love, joy, peace, patience, all the Galatians 5, 22, 23 stuff. Be in the mindset so that when the opportunity comes up, we're ready to roll. Number two, God does the work. It is not up to us to change a life. The miraculous transformational work is done by the power of the Holy Spirit. Our job is to verbally communicate it. So there's no pressure And remember, God also does the timing of all of this as well. A seed planted today may sprout years and years later. Number three, be the hands and feet of Jesus. Simply serve. You don't have to go door to door or be standing on the street corner to communicate the gospel. You can just serve. And I wouldn't add to that. I would encourage you always be prepared. 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared when you're serving so that you can answer if, says, if somebody says, why are you doing this? Have an answer for the reason, for the hope that you have. Number four, see and celebrate others. Be like Carla. See and celebrate them for who they are. It could be the cashier. It could be a coworker. It could be a family member or friend at Thanksgiving. But be the presence of the gospel during this holiday season. And fifth, never do this alone. Don't fish alone. God has designed us to do this together. And there's something powerful and exponential and impact when we partner together and do that. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for the fact that you have called us to communicate your gospel to people around us. Lord, I pray that we would be a church that uses our God-given gifts from you, Lord, that we would use those to communicate your truth to others. Lord, I pray that we would live differently and that we would be an encouragement to people who have made a really tough choices in their life and, and they're in a really tough spot. So God, I just pray that you'd fill us with your Holy Spirit today. Encourage us so that we could see and celebrate others. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, John. Wow. I love the part from Ephesians that says that we do this in the fullness of the power of Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, and the work is not done by us, but we're called to love. We're just called to love and be who we are. That's another thing I love about Carla and Heather's story, to just be who you are, because that's how God is going to use you in the ways that he has intended. So let's continue to think about that as we stand and just commit to doing this in the power of Jesus Christ as we go forth. There is an everlasting kindness you lavished on us when the radiance of heaven came to rescue the lost. You called the sheep without a shepherd. 
to leave their distress for your screams of forgiveness and the shade of your rest and with compassion for the Let us listen to the word of the Lord from Revelation chapter 7, verses from 9 to 12. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor to be our God forever and ever. Amen. There's an endless song waiting to be sung with the voice of every tribe, the song of every tongue. When the bride of Christ on that day of days, brings with joy unto the Lamb, a multitude of praise. Like the roar of mighty sea, the clouds of thunder in His people sing. Hallelujah, hallelujah, for the Lord.
when you leave the worship center I encourage you to head right down that hall to the activity center and sample some of the many foods that represent our impact partners around the world you'll also have a chance to hear about some summer mission opportunities that are planned for next summer and our benediction this morning is from that fantastic book of Ephesians chapter 3 now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his great power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, now and forever. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.